Hi guys, I'm back already. Thanks for saving my spot. The line at the concession stand wasn't long at all if you need to dash out and get something. Once this game gets started, they might not even have an intermission. But they still have plenty of Cracker Jacks and hot dogs if you need to run and get some. And thanks to a couple of super sweet sponsors, they even have snow cones and those big salted pretzels for the event. So a special thank you to our sponsors. Yeah, go get some snacks and make it fast. It looks like God's team has already taken the field and introduced themselves. Although it looks like the moon and Mars are still goofing about in the dugout. So I think you've still got time. What a lineup. Who could ever go up against God's team? I've never been to such an event as this. We already know who's going to win this game, but I think there's going to be some big surprises and spectacular moments, no doubt. Today, I'm going to go over the three messages from the three angels of Revelation chapter 14. Then, for those who want to hang out, I'll go into more teaching about how God's clock works and show more about the Revelation chapter 7 sign, mostly for those who would like more explanation about God's clock. I've decided to create a separate video concerning this slide about the dawning of the age of Aquarius. I don't want this video to get too scattered with information, so I'll try to have that one posted tomorrow and it should be a relatively short video. So John is telling us that during the game, there's going to be three angels that fly through the heavens with messages for everyone. Coming over the loudspeakers straight from heaven and probably blasting all over the planet. These are the three great American eclipses. One flew right over my head at over 7,500 miles per hour back in October. And on the eighth day after the war in Israel started. So I definitely heard that message loud and clear. Babylon has fallen. When I originally talked about this eclipse in a previous video, this website at greatamericaneclipse.com is talking about Reedsport, Oregon being the first place that the moon's shadow touches the U.S. And it's got a nice map. I live where the red X is, but it was so gloomy and rainy that morning, I didn't get to see anything. I thought it might go dark even through the gloomy morning, but no, I didn't detect much of anything. So. The stats over at timeanddate.com, well, for some reason, it just gives me Coos Bay, which is right next to Reedsport, but it is saying that maximum eclipse when it touched the U.S. was at 9.18 a.m. So when I looked up all this in Stellarium, I set my timestamp at 9.18. I was also doing a side-by-side -side comparison of the morning that Jesus first entered the temple in Jerusalem. According to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, Jesus was taken to the temple in Jerusalem for his circumcision on his eighth day. If he was born on 9-11 of 3 BC, that being his first day, then 918 would have been his eighth day. And I just find it all a bit mind bending that these two moments in time, over 2,000 years apart, are such a perfect match. And what are the odds that the first time Jesus ever entered the temple in Jerusalem was 918, and the exact moment? the full eclipse touched the U.S. was also 9.18 a.m. 
You just can't make this stuff up, people. Only God could have worked this out. And the eclipse was also on the eighth day after Israel was attacked, since the attack happened first thing in the morning of October 7th, and the eclipse was one week later on October 14th, and both on Saturday Sabbath days too. Looking at these two screenshots of Circumcision Day of 918 and 918 AM, the exact minute the maximum eclipse first touched the U.S. that day. And even Mercury standing right there in nearly the same spot. There is no way that this can be just a coincidence. And this second eclipse was called the wedding ring eclipse because it looked like it was on the wedding ring finger of Virgo. Perhaps a reminder to Israel of their marriage covenant with God. On the eighth day after their war began. And a stark reminder of Jesus shedding his blood for his Abrahamic covenant with God in the temple at Jerusalem on his eighth day. The first time he ever entered the temple in Jerusalem. And as I was saying in my last video, that I believe John wrote his gospel after he was given the disclosure. Most of the biggest moments of his gospel are nowhere to be found in the other gospels. The marriage at Cana and turning the water to wine, the healing at the sheep market pool, the woman at the well, and so much more even the rising of Lazarus. Nowhere in the other Gospels. I find it interesting that in John's Gospel, chapter 7, Jesus didn't even go to the Feast of Tabernacles, but it says he went later, in secret. That's exactly what it says. In Greek, the word is concealed. Then it says, in verse 737, those triple sevens again. In the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit. So that was the great eighth day of tabernacles, and also the very day the war began in Israel. The very next chapter is the scene of the woman caught in adultery, when it says that Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple. It just reminds me of the second eclipse, matching perfectly with the very first time Jesus ever entered the temple in Jerusalem. And in that scene, which I feel like John is telling us was the very next Sabbath after the great eighth day of tabernacles, just the same as the second eclipse. The Sabbath, after the great eighth day, when Israel was attacked. And John writes that Jesus even stooped down twice and made his marks on the ground in his silent judgment of them all. And that's what the second eclipse did. Strike number two, right across the U.S. and even down across the Yucatan and all the way across South America too. All of the Americas are one-third of the landmass of the planet, and Israel is at war. And the message of angel number two, Babylon has fallen. The first angel with the message in chapter 14 is short and to the point. 
John writes, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation, and kindred, and tongue, and people. So what did the angel say? John tells us, The angel said with a loud voice, Fear God, and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. That was the message. And I think the first great American eclipse that happened in 2017 was around the time that many started to really sense that perhaps we are nearing the end. With all these blood moon tetrads on all the Jewish feast days, for two years, and the Revelation 12 sign, and two more eclipses coming that will totally traverse the entire U.S., with the third one being seven years away. Oh yeah, a lot of people were really starting to pay attention to things, and even seeing that the first eclipse as it flew through the heavens right over our heads darkened seven Salem's in its path, an ominous sign, as if taking peace from the earth, and starting at Salem, which means peace, and short for the city of peace, Jerusalem, the Lord's city, and in the 33rd state, and ending at the 33rd parallel, Jesus' numbers again. I really think that's when a lot of people started listening to what these messages are of these three angels or eclipses of our star. Well, the Psalms match to years, and Psalm 117 for 2017 is the everlasting gospel, as it says, for all nations and all people. And it is the shortest chapter in the whole Bible, and in the midpoint of the Bible as well. The message is simple, just as the first angel said, Praise the Lord, for his merciful kindness is great toward us, and the truth of the Lord endureth forever. Praise ye the Lord. And the third message of the third angel of Revelation chapter 14 is a very serious message. And right after that, John writes, And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. That's the third eclipse that's going to happen on Monday. I'm not trying to fearmonger here, but the book of Revelation is serious business. And as I was saying last time, John saw all this stuff happen. He was there, and he's telling us about it, warning us all. It's not like he's just a prophet saying that in the future people will eventually fall into immorality and chaos and will have to face the wrath of God over it. No, he was actually taken out of space-time and shown the future. He gives us all these markers that people have been finding in the heavens and on earth real events that he wrote down 2,000 years ago. And it's all happening, just as he told us he saw. I'm not sure what's about to happen when this third eclipse flies through the heavens next Monday. But I just got myself some extra snacks at the concession stand. So, for the rest of this video, it's going to be a sort of extra credit session for those who feel like they would like a little more exposure or 
understanding of astronomy things and how God's clock works. And there might even be some fun little surprises that not everyone is aware of. If you are kind of new to all this, and these four new beasts standing at the four corners of the earth for the age of Aquarius that John is talking about in Revelation, then hang around with me for a little longer, and you might be smiling by the end because you might know things that others around you don't know. And that's always kind of fun, isn't it? I'll mostly just be going over more about the Revelation chapter 7 sign and trying to explain how John's puzzle works, like what it's all about. I understand that not everyone is on the same page when it comes to astronomy stuff. I'm certainly no expert, but I'll do my best. So, if you already understand what I was showing in my last video, when John gives us the clues in Revelation chapter 7 about what exactly it was that he saw in the heavens on 313 of 2016, when God had all his bases loaded. If you're totally set with what I was saying, then it's class dismissed, and you can cut out whenever you feel like it, and I won't really be saying anything new as far as discoveries or anything. Just teaching a little more and a recap of sorts. So, what I was showing last time. On 313 of 2016, John saw all seven of God's luminaries standing at the four corners of the earth, occupying the four new beasts in the heavens for the age of Aquarius, the lion, the calf, the one with the face as a man, and the flying eagle, which is Scorpio. And the sun was also standing in Aquarius to command them all, our superstar, rising or ascending in the east, only seven days before the equinox. That's the Revelation chapter 7 sign. I'm not sure where to start with all this about how God's clock works, but it might help to just start with the equinoxes and our procession. In this screenshot, I've turned off the horizon line so you can get a better view of the constellations. But the big red E for due east is the horizon line. And since I've got the sun sitting right on it as best I can, it represents sunrise at the horizon at the spring equinox, when the sun rises exactly due east each year in the spring. But as we are standing on the earth, our whole backdrop of stars appears to move across the sky so slowly that we really can't perceive it. Over an entire person's lifetime, the sun will always appear to rise in the same place against the backdrop of stars every year on the same date. It will only appear to shift in the heavens by one day every 128 years, way more than a lifetime. So, like wherever the point in the backdrop of stars that the sun rises on your birthday will pretty much be the same throughout your whole life. Like on my birthday, the sun always rises every year about two days distance before the sun enters the waters of Aquarius. So if the sun is starting out at the spring equinox, it will appear to walk through the constellations, as each day it will move through the heavens by a little bit, and making the entire 360 degree round, or circuit, through all 12 constellations on its journey through the heavens in one year, or 365 days, and end up once again on the spring equinox 
in the same place in the heavens. And in this scene, the sun and the planets move through the constellations from right to left. So from Aquarius and through Pisces and through Aries. And they will always stay within the bounds of a path through the heavens. Like they don't just travel all over the place through the constellations, but only in a defined path and through only the 12 constellations in a circle. This is called the ecliptic for a fancy word. And that's how we get the 12 zodiac signs of Leo and Virgo and Libra and Scorpio and all that stuff. So over long periods of time, the whole backdrop of stars is ever so slowly moving as it appears from our vantage point on Earth. What I'm showing here in this picture is the spring equinox or vernal equinox, the day each year in the spring when the sun will rise exactly due east. This screenshot is showing how far the backdrop of stars has moved during an entire age, the age of Pisces. Each age lasts about 2,160 years, and I think we actually ended the age of Pisces in 2016, which I'll talk about in my next video. The age of Pisces started somewhere around 144 BC. A few years either way isn't going to make a difference here, but against our backdrop of stars, the spring equinox always occurred at the start of the age of Pisces in 144 BC, right next to that band of the first fish of Pisces. So you can see, we were done with the age of Aries. That would have been the times of Abraham and Moses. And actually, at the time of the great exodus from Egypt, the spring equinox would appear around the hind foot of Aries. On the right side of the picture here, you can see that our backdrop of stars has moved so much in well over 2,000 years that now our spring equinox, when the sun rises exactly due east, it occurs below the belly of that second fish of Pisces. And as I'll show in my next video, our spring equinox is now technically in the age of Aquarius. And in another 2,000 years, it's going to be way over in Aquarius. That's why we have the ages on God's clock. And I'll show more about this with some other slides in a minute. And the only other day of the year when the sun will rise exactly due east is at the fall equinox, which happens during our current times when the sun is on the shoulder of Virgo. Here is a picture of our current fall equinox, and I've turned on the horizon line so you can see that it seems our queen virgin, who has reigned supreme as our fall equinox for thousands of years, and it seems the virgin is about to lose her head, definitely beheaded as we enter the age of Aquarius. Here is a screenshot for 600 years from now. And as you can see at the fall equinox, Virgo will have no part of it. King Leo the lion will rule at the fall equinox, which is one of the four corners of the earth for the age of Aquarius. It's why John told us about the lion being one of the four beasts of heaven. And as I was saying last time, Virgo is a real space hog when it comes to constellations, and God has divided the heavens into equal parts, 
just like the hours on our clocks. And when the age of Pisces began, Virgo the Virgin was on her knees, perhaps in solemn prayer at the equinox. That's how God has divided the Queen of Heaven, on her knees and off with her head. The fall equinoxes, 2,160 years apart. The start and end of the age of Pisces, or the church age, or one hour on God's clock. And just like on our clocks, it is 30 degrees of the wheel of heaven. And this is why I like to talk about things in Stellarium, because you can't argue with what I'm showing here. So last time, I was showing how John has already been to the future. And he told us that when the game starts, God's bases were loaded. And he saw four angels occupying the four corners of the earth, all at the same time. And you can think of these four corners sort of like a baseball diamond, with all these planets running around the bases. So perhaps Aquarius is home. I showed these two slides a few videos ago, but hopefully these things might be making more sense to those who haven't really studied all this stuff before. This is our wheel of constellations, or the ecliptic in the heavens. We have the 12 constellations that the planets and sun appear to move through as time passes and throughout the year. And their path through the heavens only goes through these 12 constellations as they run their circuit around the potter's field of dreams. The four corners of the earth are God's divisions of the darkness and the light, the two equinoxes and solstices each year. And as I've been showing you here, during the age of Pisces, we had Pisces the two fish as our head corner at the spring equinox, and Virgo occupied the fall equinox. And at the winter solstice, we had Sagittarius. He's the rider on the horse with the bow and the crown that is being cast to the ground in the heavens. At summer solstice, we had the Gemini twins, Castor and Pollux, also known as great horsemen, the sons of thunder, the sons of Zeus. And as I've been showing also, because remember what I was showing about how the backdrop of stars is moving ever so slowly across time, and we are now entering a whole new age, and we officially now have four new beasts standing at the four corners of the earth, the divisions of darkness and light. We now have Aquarius as the head and the spring equinox, and I think that's what this final eclipse is really all about that is happening on the very band of the fish of Pisces cutting that band once and for all, just as Virgo is being beheaded. The church age and the fishers of men is over. It's done. Finished. And if you read Revelation chapter 16, that's exactly what God says from the throne when the seventh vial of wrath is poured into the air. It is done. And now that the Virgin seems to be beheaded, we have Leo taking his position as second base and the fall equinox. And we have Taurus standing at the summer solstice and Scorpio as our winter solstice. And from what I understand, John was in fact taken to the future and shown the judgments at the end of the age, 
that happened when the age of Pisces ended. And I believe it will happen on April 8th of 2024, just as John is showing us all, and gave us very specific signs in the heavens to look for, and concerning these beasts of heaven. As I've been going over in several of my last videos. So, for the Revelation chapter 7 sign, John gives us a little puzzle to work out and gives us the clues to look for in the heavens. So, to work out John's puzzle, we have to find a time on God's clock when we have at least four planets all occupying the four constellations that are the four corners of heaven, bases loaded. And at the same time, John tells us that he saw the sun ascending in the east as the team captain and ordering the others not to make their moves just yet. So one, we know it has to be in the fairly recent past when he saw this sign in the heavens. That's the opening verses from Revelation chapter 7. I know God's clock can get super complicated, but just look at this as a clock face that I have drawn out here. And each hour on the clock would represent the 12 constellations or at least the way God has divided them. Because, as I showed you, Virgo takes up a lot of room in the heavens. But God has divided her so that she has specific markers and will only really be allotted her exact 30 degrees of the clock, or 2,160 years. So, Let's just look at a blank clock face and what's going on here. This might help to understand how to work out this puzzle that John has given us with his clues. As God's planets and luminaries appear to run around the clock in the heavens, they run around in a circle and don't just run all over the place in the heavens. They stay fairly tight on a circular path through the heavens that we call the ecliptic. The sun appears to travel this line as well because we are viewing all this from the earth. So I'm just going to mark earth as being in the middle of the clock here, like a pitcher's mound. And we would have our 360 degree view all the way around us to look at this path that all these planets are racing around. So. We've got seven visible with the naked eye luminaries or planets, including the sun and our moon, that we are taking into consideration. Seven total. So let me just make some colored dots around the wheel. And I'll make some lines here so you can sort of envision all this as the hands of a clock, where perhaps the sun would be the hour hand and maybe Mercury as the minute hand, and the moon as the second hand on the clock. But it's a complicated clock, and we need to add four more hands for the other planets. And just like on our clocks, these hands all go around at different speeds, because the planets all go at different speeds too. Oh, and there's more. There is also an illusion that is created when the planets appear to stop and go backwards in their courses. This is called retrograde. Just imagine if you were keeping an eye on your big wall clock at work and suddenly you see the minute hand going backwards. I'm sure you would have some complaints with your boss about that one. Well, God's clock has seven visible hands on it, not just the hour, minute, and second hands like our clocks do, but seven. And some of them are always going backwards and forwards, as if they are doing the tango or something. So John's puzzle is, I saw four angels 
which would be four of the planets, standing at the four corners of the earth, bases loaded and batter up. And in chapter 4, he made it clear that the four beasts of heaven at the four corners were a lion, which is Leo, a calf, which is Taurus, a face as a man, Aquarius, and a flying eagle, which is also known these days as Scorpio. And John gives us another requirement in his puzzle, and that is, he saw another angel ascending or rising from the east, who is commanding them all. That would be our son at one of the equinoxes. So he's no doubt playing umpire at the spring equinox. I think you are about to see what's going on here, and I actually think God may be a bit of a baseball fan. So that's the puzzle. You have to find the exact time on God's crazy clock here, when the sun is at least very near one of the two equinoxes, Aquarius or Leo the Lion. And you have to have at least four planets occupying the four corners of the Lion, the Calf, Aquarius, and Scorpio. If you have a copy of Stellarium yourself, it's a fun little game. And if you can find any other solution to the puzzle other than the two that I've talked about in my last video, please share your findings with us. So this is what I found. And I searched forward and backward about a month both ways at all the equinoxes going back into the past. And the sign appeared seven days before the spring equinox of 2016. And we don't just have four planets occupying the four bases, but all seven of our luminaries are in position at the four corners of the Earth. We've got the Sun, which is technically in Aquarius here, playing the umpire at home base, and shouting out to the whole team not to make a move until we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And there is Venus in the belly of Aquarius, and Mercury standing right exactly on the line of the waters of Aquarius at sunrise at Potter's Field. In Taurus, the summer solstice as first base, we've got the moon. In Leo, the fall equinox as second base, we've got King Jupiter. And in Scorpio, as third base, and the winter solstice, we've got Saturn and Mars. And what's more is this date, March 13th of 2016, just so happened to also be the exact same date of March 13th as the menorah sign in the heavens of March 13th of 2024 which is the opening verses of Revelation chapter 15. Those two dates are exactly eight years apart. And these two signs in the heavens that John saw are also exactly eight chapters apart. So I hope all that helps people understand this sign or signal that John gave us in the opening verses of Revelation chapter 7. I'll try to have another video out as soon as possible to talk about the signs of the stars of Aquarius as we enter the new age, and hopefully it won't be as long or complicated. If you made it this far, you probably need to run and grab some snacks. The opposing team is warming up and smoking hot and they never ever play by the rules. And look, they are headed for their dugout now. If you hear the national anthem, hurry up. You do not want to miss the start of this one.